Um, okay, H hello everyone, um, and welcome to chapter eighteen of uh, outstanding uh, of our book club on um, outstanding user interfaces with Shiny. Um, and uh, this week we will be learning how to make custom inputs that you. Um, the past few sessions we've been building out like an html template that is based on a bootstrap 4 based library called tabler um and we are so we've two chapters ago we looked at how to add the dependencies for tabler um a chapter ago we were looking at how to define things like pages and, and, and stuff that, that using the tabler um, template. And here we're going to be adding input elements, um, buttons and switches, and is it a text box or is it a select, a toggle switch and a, um, and a menu input um and how to do these in a way that's like compatible with how shiny um handles input elements and that works in a way that that you know the the user interface is consistent with the tabler theme that we've been building out um so i have been um Hmm, that's funny. I go up here to be able to share. Is it that one? That one. I'm assuming. Are you looking at our studio or are you looking at um our studio? Good. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. I can never quite tell. <laughs> um, right. Uh, so um, let me see if I can move. Right. Um, so what I did prior to last week was I put a lot of the code, a lot of the functions that were developed in chapter 17 into a package. So um so for example, there were there was a example um so the yeah so so that i can use these elements um and create a kind of tabler themed shiny app if i if i want to um so if i so a simple example in chapter 17 that can run uh, Yeah, so for example, if I copy over some code from um, from chapter 17, this will create a page within which there's just a, a body element that, that prints hello world and there's a trivial server function. Oops, I still managed to get it wrong. Um, right. okay. uh, let's try that again. Uh, oh, sorry. There will be a lot of errors today because I'm live coding a lot of stuff, even though it's basically just copying code from the book. Um, yeah, so if I delete all that and just from the shiny app, that should print hello world on a tabler themed page. Okay, cool. So yeah, so a, a lot of the functions that were discussed two weeks ago, we've I've I've, I've put in 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 here. I have a suspicion that we might find a few things that are used in chapter eighteen that I don't have a function for. But the, you know, if we get to that stage, I'm sure we can find the relevant code. Okay, so 
the custom input. So that little example I've just shown you had a trivial server function that was like, there's no reactive dependencies or anything like that. It's as simple as it could possibly be. And that's really, that's the dream shiny app. One way it does absolutely nothing and still everyone's happy, but that's not, it's not going to pay the bills. Um, so um, what we need to do is to, um, you know, take information from the user, take information from, you know, data sets and stuff like that, and present analyses and graphs and things like that to, to, to the user. Um, and that kind of stuff, you need interactivity to, to um, achieve. And input widgets are kind of the first step of doing that. Now, um, um, in Shiny, there already is things. So in this chapter, we're going to look at a button, a switch, and a menu input. And Shiny already has them. And it already has, you know, the TypeScript or the JavaScript written to take input data from an element like that on the, on the front end from the user's interaction with that element. Shiny already has code that will respond to those events and send an appropriate message to the server. And when what, what the author seems to be emphasizing in this chapter is that like, because Shiny can already do a lot of that stuff, or it already has the handler code and things already written for, for these elements. Try to use what Shiny's already written rather than rolling your own solutions for these things. So it would be quite easy. Well, I mean, it would be relatively easy at least to write all the code you need to make a button work and, and for it to respond to user, uh, user um, input. But the shiny developers have already written that code and you can just piggyback on their code and use it for your custom user interface elements in, in a lot of settings. So the code looks like this for a shiny action button. So let's, let's see. So you have da, 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 some value and then um da, 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 this is a like a the the code that would go on the user interface side so you'd call you'd put action button with some identifier and a label and and whatnot now what actually happens um with that you can have um uh an observe event type bit of code in your server that will say whenever you see this button being pressed do these actions um and the way that the way that that works is the um the observe event thing looks for changes in a value that is stored in the, the like the input um I'm sorry, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just close a couple of things because there's some financially like <laughs> uh, pertinent documents up on my other screen that I don't want to make any mistakes with. Right. Um, uh, right. So, um, yes. So your code, when you're using these action buttons, you might have a UI. Fluid page with like action button and um, some label. Okay. And then you can do, um, we we'll use the same server as above. What was it? So that's added a button that just says press here. Um, now, if I click on this, um, nothing obvious is actually happening. Um, we can actually 
do um, if we define a different server. that does event, um, what would it be, input dollar b. Um, and all that's going to do is um, let's try that again. So if I run this now, every time I click here, it should print the value that's currently associated with that button as far as the shiny server side is concerned. So every time I press on that, the number associated with that input is increasing. And it's that change in value that shiny is responding to that that, that is causing this observe event thing to run. Um, so if we're writing a custom button, we'd want to replicate the way that the Shiny action button works uh, because it's what the Shiny developers used to, even though we want our new button to look like it matches the theme that we're working on. Um, so this is the 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 code for that action button you've got a a bit of html and um but really the the place where the work goes on the place that kind of binds um the user's clicking of that button element to a change in the shiny back end is in the um input binding in um, the the shiny TypeScript code. Um, so you have some code that looks like this. This is like the JavaScript equivalent of it, um, where um, da, 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 what happens is you have a an input binding object that we are adding that, that that shiny has added functionality to so in order to find action buttons on a shiny page it uses this method here so what it's looking for is any element on the page that has an action button class and to you will also need code to get the value that's stored within that button to update the value stored in that button if necessary to um uh increment the 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 you know yeah um if we are writing our own custom button element then we can just use exactly the same code without without having to actually write any of it we can use the shiny code provided we add this action button class to the html for our button that we write hopefully that makes sense um okay so um so what we want to do is um this is the table html button to the shiny action button um so this code here is what is what you would is what you would use if you had loaded up all the table of dependencies and you wanted to make a button that matched the tabler um theme um okay so what we can do is how does it work where do we add the action button code in maybe that's in a little bit 
I wasn't seeing quite right. Oh no, yes. So um so this is the the skeleton for a button, right? So you again you've got the input ID and the label, much like you have for the shiny action button thing. Additionally, I think there's a status argument that they don't have in the shiny version, but but we'll we'll get to that. Um so let's just write this code and fill it in. So if I do I use this and then do I haven't already written it. Then we'll copy that. Right. Um so at present, if I use this function, it wouldn't do a great deal. Um, and so what are we doing? We want a element with corners. Yeah, so we want to be able to generate HTML that looks like this, where the label here gets put into here and um the input id would be stored as the id of the the, the element right um so we can generate what's this button button action so the button primary thing here um is you can have like alert buttons or you can have um other kind of status colored uh, uh buttons within tabler um we would typically just use primary but um so anyway i'll do i'll just fill in this code so basically this code here is just to make sure that um the button class is added and the button primary class is added if no status is provided for that button um and otherwise if a status is added then you know if it's status equals alert then it will get a class of like button dash alert right so we'll copy that into the code but um you can see that any button that we make with this function we'll have an action button class uh, where's the actual code um yeah and then there's updates an icon but we don't need to worry about the the icons are a, a, a less relevant bit um the whole code may be found here let's open that and i'll show you the additional stuff that we need to do so we're wanting to create an element that looks like this where so we've got we want to be able to pass in this class string as this we want to pass in the id string as the id and we want to ensure that it's a, a button element and if any child elements are passed in we want them added to the html as well the actual code for it uh -huh, looks like this and yeah so we've got the button class code exactly the same um the value this is something that was present in the shiny code for this for an action button and finally we just add the html tags um so the id any style that might be provided and the type is the you know the the, the button element thing that so we've got that right um and that's a working bit of button code let's kind of write some write a, an app that will work with that okay um 
So if I load that up again. And then copy over this code. All the elements here, the button and the body and the page, I've already got functions for in this package. Right? So we can run that. And um, in the server, what happens is whenever whenever the user clicks on the button, the current value stored within the button is a, is is presented in on on the the text for the button, right? So I can click on it. And you can see that the values are incremented. And the reason that values are incremented, we've written no JavaScript, we've written no TypeScript here. We've only written like user interface style code within R. The reason it's working is because Shiny has already implemented that kind of, you know, button increment feature for us. So we can just piggyback on um shiny's code and that works nicely um it's quite a nice looking button to be honest much nicer than the the, the original shiny action button that i showed you in the, the first example that we ran through um but hopefully you can get the idea that like you know it will get much more complicated but for um for a lot of um for a lot of the the kind of elements that you might need to add into a, a code if you're trying to be into an app if you're trying to replicate some html theme shiny probably has already implemented um the the, the code that will handle the user events and things yes so hopefully that was um straightforward do ask if 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 it wasn't if there was anything that i kind of glossed over um yeah and that's what it looks like in in there so yeah don't try to reinvent the wheel so so russa just um make sure to just kind of cement my understanding so like this this works only because of the the, the existing javascript that's um you know within shiny that reacts basically that does something for elements that have a certain class right which is i guess yeah from, yeah yeah from like bootstrap three so i guess if you were then implementing let's say a button and you're bringing in like a different class from i don't know maybe bootstrap five is let's imagine it's not yeah it's compatible yeah. right then then you'd have to go like adapt you'd have to probably you'd have to write your own javascript code on on on, on the back end right that, Possibly, that would probably i don't know to be honest i mean um the the shiny javascript code may still work and but you may need to add in appropriate um appropriate um html code such that the shiny equivalent of that element can be you know such that your custom version of that element can be found by shiny's um javascript code yeah yeah i see what you mean uh, yeah um yeah so the yeah so the only reason this worked is because we added this action button class if i remove that and save it and do all the original all of that, it will still look exactly the same apart from the value being absent um and every time I click on it, nothing will happen. And that's because Shiny's event handlers and stuff like that for action buttons can no longer find this element and can no longer update it and, and things. Um, but, um, by adding that class in, we sell that, save ourselves a lot of, um, you know, potentially head scratching work um cool um yes so the next thing we're going to look at is a little switch i'll show you what it looks like um here so it's a little switch like this and i think i think the example you click on this go button here and that causes the switch to go from being on to being off or something like that 
right. Um, okay, so um, yeah, you can. What's this? Is that going to? Yeah, that goes to tablers form elements. Um, if we look at that and we try and find a what was it again? Form switch. Form check form switch. So it's code that looks like this to create a um one of those little switch things and um you know things will be appropriately styled if you have the right classes on them and things and and will be styled by um the the, the kind of css code for tabler that we've included as part of the dependencies um these switches can either be checked or unchecked and um and so when they're checked you have the thing pointing on the right hand side and when they're unchecked they're pointing on the left hand side um so we can generate html code that looks quite similar to that quite easily um um as a checkbox type which is very similar to the shiny checkbox. If we look at the HTML code for shiny's checkbox input, it's just going to show me exactly the same as what's on there. We have um, so we've got class of form group shiny input container. But it's yeah, and it's form dash check input is the class and here we've got the type of the element being checkbox whereas here in shiny's base code um the class is checkbox rather than the type oh no hold on there's a type equals checkbox down here as well so maybe i've missed a subtlety there yeah so the switch has the checkbox type um, and here in the shiny version it was like the the label for the switch that had that checkbox type Something like that. um we we should be able to build on the say on the the, the shiny input binding again if we copy that uh, link there um what it will do is find thing tries to find anything with um a an input what's that now that's a an input element where its type um attribute is checkbox so um, what will that find for us? In the shiny code, it will find this element here. It will find any element of that structure across the whole, whole of an app. Here, it will find that code. Um, so again, the, I mean, the, hold on. No, that's the shiny thing, isn't it? Um, where's the here in the tabler equivalent it would look for an input element that has a type um attribute that is has a string checkbox in it um okay so it we should be finding comparable elements if we use the tabler code for defining these switches as if we were using the shiny code for these switches um so we can do the same thing again um and um,
So we need, um, hold on, what was, what is it now? It's formals, isn't it? Yeah, so um, the the signature for, for Chinese checkbox input, it takes an input ID, a label, a value with the default of false, which is the same here, and a width with a default value of null. So from the the UI code that you would write in your Shiny app looks exactly the same, um, but you're just using a different function name um with the the newly defined checkbox input thing um and we can fill in the code for that so right so what's the code actually look like uh for check input so we've got now we saw this kind of code in the action button code as well um and what does that do now? That I, I think that's like, what's this? Any possible bookmarked value with restore input? Okay. Um, but that would take default equals value. Right, anyway. Um, yeah, so if there's something, if there's something bookmarked in the app that that such that its identifier matches one that we try and construct with this function, it will take whatever value has been stored for that. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely certain what's going on there. So I don't really use bookmarking that much. Um, input tag we probably need as well. Um, so how does this work? The input tag for a shiny action button just uses the input ID and type equals checkbox. Um, whereas the, um, is that right? So, it was ID equals input ID type equals checkbox. And for tabler, it was input class equals form check input. And additionally, you had this type equals checkbox. Sorry, yeah, type equals checkbox, the same as you do for the shiny element. But you also have this class form check input as well. Um, so we have to include those elements in here as well. So the, the only difference there is that you've got this class element, a class attribute as well. Um, yeah, so it's it's here. It's showing you the same code that I showed earlier on in the in the shiny binding for um, the the checkbox input thing. It searches for elements that have this um, structure. So the input elements that have an attribute called type that has this value called check. And we're replicating that here by adding the checkbox value. Okay. Um, that is null and the value. Value parameters. So, um, what this is, this code here, is if the value thing here is set to something other than false or null. So if it's null, then the switch will look like it's off. If the value is false, 
the switch will look like it's off. But if it's any other value, like I'm assuming true is the only kind of sensible alternative, um, it will look like the switch is checked. So if you look um, here in the code for tabler, there's one element that says checked and a bunch of others that don't. And this will be the only one that's kind of clicked to the right of, of those. Um, so if I take that over, so we're, we've got this input tag, um, that's the, the base one. If a non null, non false value is, um, provided for, for this argument, then we'll additionally be adding the attribute checked equals checked. Um, and that will cause the the the, the app the, the the switch to look slightly different. Um silly question that's maybe not shiny related. Why the double ampersand? Uh or it's like the the two and signs. That's one of my favorite questions. <laughs> Um, well, there, there's this is our code, okay, and R um, has. I'm currently working in R four point three point one, I think, um, and it. If you've got, So that's vector wise and operation there. You've got this true here. Um, so the output, the first output is whether that is true and that is true. The second output is whether got that it. is true and that is true. That's the vector wise and operator. Now in 431, well, as 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 of four point three point oh, if I do that with a double ampersand, it should fail. I think the double ampersand is for scalar comparison. So, if you've got an if statement oh, okay. or a while such and such is true, that it there should be no setting when you're passing in a vector of potentially more than one true or fal false value into that statement. It sh ifs and whiles and things like that should only have access to a single true or false value. Um, and that's kind of what the double ampersand always was for, but it, it wasn't enforced that it should work the way it does. It used to be that um, ampersand, the, the double ampersand, it used to cause people a lot of pain because what it would actually do would be it would take the first element of the first vector and the first element of the second vector and them together and then just return that single value. Which, if, because it's not completely obvious why two ampersands is for scalar comparison and one ampersand is for vector comparison. And if you're used to working with um, the vector comparison operator, it still works fine if you pass in vectors of length one on, on either side of it. Um, but yeah, ultimate, the short answer is that the double ampersand and the double bar are the scalar and and the scalar or operators in R. Awesome. Thanks, Russ. I, I hadn't been paying attention to that. <laughs> um uh where am i now it is null blah 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 yes um input wrapper so um the html code for um the checkbox input the shiny checkbox input you've got this bit here which is the bit we've just constructed but you've also got this wrapper here that's like you know it's a form element and it's 
indicates that it's you know an an input container within shiny um we have to replicate that kind of code because um not not just to replicate the um the 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 shiny um checkbox input but because the tabler code has a similar wrapper where you've got class equals form check form check highlight which you can hold on is that right no look at these ones here um i think it might be all this code here between that open label and that closed label that we need in our wrapper um uh, to make it look like a tabler switch um so what we'll do is we'll replicate that i don't think i need to um do a great deal more work to make this switch work um wrapper form switch yeah so if you look at that it's form check form switch the input has form check input and type equals checkbox and then there's this little span at the bottom as well I don't know quite whether we're going to implement that here um and children yes we do re replicate that as well um so the wrapper looks like that so if i ran that as is um does that input wrapper so do we append input tag into it yeah right okay um so that would be we want that as well Oops. okay now um so the purpose of this final bit here is we're taking the input wrapper element that's an html element that defines um this label thing here i think it is form check form switch um and um adds the input tag which is that element as a child and then adds in this uh final span class thing as well um so we should at the end of all that oh don't um and if we do which of these things is absolutely essential oh, hold on no, it's not called switch <laughs> right and that should look much the same as one of these elements in here um so we've constructed the ui elements there um whether or not that will work I immediately using shiny's um um ha handlers for the checkbox input i'm not sure at present i think it does but um there may be a little bit of code needed um so we put everything together with tag append children da, 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 da. right we also need to create oh this is for updating the value we'll we'll handle that in a second um so if i just add in um what would it be oh no i might as well just add in the whole code so this thing here that's um something that you would call from the server side of your r function of, of your r code um and what it will do is it will find a particular switch and if that switch is on it will turn it off and if it's off it will turn it on um and um it takes advantage of ugh, of a function outside of my package i don't even know i've got um
Or would it just use like the input handler for, for checkboxes and shiny? Because it looks like it's doing the send input message. Uh, yes, I think it would. Yeah, yeah. Um, the 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 handlers for uh, have I already got that open? Um, subscribe here. Um, it would send. Is it checkbox input binding? Is that the one that is sending? Uh, uh, message. Oh, that's funny. Um, where uh, is subscribe? Isn't it the thing that changes the value? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's set value l dot checked equals value. So it just sends a value over. Um, yeah. Um, yes. So it will still be using the the shiny bindings for checkboxes input, but using them to modify a. Uh, a slightly different user interface the element. Um, I'll just copy that over so that it's um, so that it's in the package as well. Right. Let's see if we can get that example code to work. Because a lot of the times when I'm working through these books and stuff, it like you like following along and understanding what it's explaining in the book and then you try and make a package out of the same kind of stuff and it all falls apart and like uh, it's quite hard to work out what's gone wrong um yeah but right, you're doing it the right way russ it's really easy to like nod your head and it's like oh yeah this makes sense and, and then doing it is quite another thing <laughs> yeah I, I to be honest given the time i don't think we'll get to the actual substantial uh, example in in any detail um but yeah but, but the, this is kind of the principle overall though right? yeah you know yeah um right let's see if we can do this so this should generate a little app where you can toggle the switch by hand or you can click a button and that will force the the switch to toggle um so okay so i can toggle the switch oh it's printing out messages as well what message am i getting here what did switch serve event is it printing I was printing something that i didn't expect All right anyway uh, if i click go it will set it to true and then turn it off again and i can do that with the switch as well uh yeah so um so again we've written no javascript code we've taken advantage of stuff that shiny already has in place we've basically just copied some html code from tabler to create a button and a switch that um match the tabler theme but are written in such a way that the handlers for shiny's elements can work with them as well um which kind of it, it future proofs your code as well but i can't quite see Russ, um, why, I, I, why I, if i remember message. correctly like tablers um were from earlier chapters within the section of tablers bringing in bootstrap 5. do you know if, if like a matter of course like is bootstrap meant to be backwards compatible i mean at least in the narrow sense that if if a class was defined in a previous version that that class is still defined i mean it, it's oh i don't know of, that actually rules may no, not be. Well, i i actually suspect it probably won't be to be honest oh, okay. uh, there may be sim similarities in the way that they're named and things like that but i, I suspect that they will have changed um the... so I'm, I'm i'm wondering if this this action button thing you know if this if this is coming from bootstrap or from shiny or from where mm. so i'm just saying like an, as a matter of principle like let's say you're you wanted to create some kind of new inputs or new something right mm. um that utilized maybe a newer version of bootstrap I mean, would would you have any guarantees that i guess you just have to look at the specifics of whether like the classes you're using or are available in older versions of Bootstrap, and then more importantly, that that Shiny's um, 
Chinese JavaScript is actually looking for those classes. Like if you yeah. want to piggyback off of their off yeah. of their JavaScript. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, but the I mean the the code hit you can't you basically can't expect that um, the the classes used by Shiny to find elements and to to manipulate elements will be present in the bootstrap class terminology or be used within it um but you can readily add any of this so that's what we did um here i think was we added um oh no maybe it was actually maybe it was important so yeah here we added something in specifically to make sure that Chinese handlers could work with an otherwise native tabler button. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. But, um, but that one is like, a good that's, question, that's a though, bootstrap yeah. class, right, though? Action button? I'll, I'll look at it. Oh, ah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess so, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, yes. Uh, anyway, I'll just I'll take you through this example, but I won't code it up um, because it's it's it, it's a lot more substantial than the other two, and that's why I focused on the other two. <laughs> um, right. So the the purpose here. Hold on. I'll show you what it looks like in the thing. Um, um, it hasn't actually. Um, Okay, that's not quite. I thought it would show a picture of the thing. Um, yeah, uh, there, there was stuff in an earlier chapter where um, we were binding things that aren't typical input elements um, to um, Shiny's input variables um so you can you know link a, um so that you can you know you can work out things like what is the visible tab at the moment or something like that um whereas a, a, a like a primary input element might be something that you type text into or a button that you click or something like that. um da, 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 da. yeah so the the purpose was at the time what we were doing was to detect whether a, a box was expanded or contracted on the in in the the in the browser um yeah here the example is so you might have a, a you know a a, t a tab page layout so that you have multiple tabs on that page and um, the user can select to view the first or the second or the third. Shiny doesn't necessarily like have a way of knowing which one is the currently active one. Um, and that's quite useful to know in some settings. So, um, so what they do here is they make a, um, a, a like a navbar menu in the tabler theme that um that will capture which is the currently active tab basically um yes but there's a lot of code involved in writing this um so um firstly we would have to define a way to find the um the tabs on that nav bar and you know find uh so that finds all of the available tabs on the nav bar um to what does this do again um so we'd have an initialize method so if you look at the bindings 
just initialize for a typical thing. Maybe there isn't one. Um, so we are looking at um, an element and determining whether it is the active tab. And it will be the active tab if it has a class. Hold on. Yes, this is searching for an element that has this class, navlink.active. Um, and if for the current element that uh, the, there is no match, then da, 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 then how does it work now? It's actually quite difficult to explain, to be honest. Um, OK, so what must it do? We ensure that if no tab is selected at the start, the first tab will be selected by default. So um, so this, but this is looking at a specific tab element. Maybe it's, oh, is it because it's finding nav bar, nav bar. Is it within the nav bar? Like, so it's yeah, like I guess it's, yeah, it must be. Nav bar? I think it might be, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's looking, yeah, yeah. So it'll be looking at all the elements um, within the nav bar. So the element here would be the nav bar as a whole. Okay, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so let's see, the role of get values to return a currently selected tab. Um, so get value is another one of these JavaScript methods. Um, given the nav bar, it will find whichever of the um, nav bar panes has this nav link active um, attribute and sorry not attribute value and then return which of those is the active uh, tab um yeah so there's i mean there's a lot of code to write to get this to work um if you wanted to provide the user an alternative way to select the currently active tab you'd have to define a set value um thing and what that would do is it would um basically it would search for the tab that the user requested and then show that to them um yeah so there's a way so we'd need a, an up so for our, our code would then need an update function to uh, make that happen um yeah, so um, I mean, it's a it, it is a considerably more complicated example than the the buttons and the sliders, but it's, it, it, I think it is worth looking through to try and follow the logic behind that one because it's. it's I'm just going to have to dig into this, Russ. I, I'm this is a separate thing, but I'm, I I I kind of spent a lot of time recently trying to figure out if there are a way to discern whether a so this is one of David's um, uh, packages, like a BS4, yeah. What is it called? BS4 yes, dash. Um, ah, yeah, yeah. Um, to try to discern whether a um, a card was collapsed or expanded. Mm. You can kind of figure that out like interactively if you throw in a browser and you <laughs> and you, you look and expect elements. But I wanted like some kind of like functional way of saying like you know, is collapsed, is expanded. And yeah, I'm guessing yeah. I may have to go into the JavaScript to to figure that out. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That, that I mean, the there was an example in chapter twelve that covered precisely that use case, I think. Um, but it, I mean, whether the code can be reused in your setting, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, because the the problem with this is like, I can see how it works. Like you might um, you might implement your own um template 
but I don't want to have to implement an entire template just to do the kind of feature that you've just described. You exactly. Know? Um, yeah. Um, but anyway, I think it's it's a very interesting chapter, and I'm kind of glad that I worked through it properly in a like package setting. Um, but yeah, the 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 final example is a little bit too long for me to have got through in in the time. But it would have been quite nice to to show you know where the JavaScript has to go and things like that. But oh, anyway, cool. Thanks everyone for coming along. Um, next time. It's chapter 19. Is that you, um, um, Arthur? I think. I think it is, yeah. Cool. So that's a little bit more about um, interactivity. So it covers things like, you know, progress bars and waiters and things like that, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, cool, cool. Um, anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed today. I've tr I tried to do it as interactively as possible, <laughs> but that also means that you do it live and things can go wrong and things, or, and you can like be talking about stuff and completely have forgotten what you're talking about. Um, but yeah, it's it's been quite an interesting case study, this section of the book. Anyway. Right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming along, and I will see you next week. Uh, see you next week. Bye-bye. Yeah.